No matter what your week was like, it's a good day, blessed day, awesome day. You know, you got it. It's about our focus, what our value is, what we're moving forward in. And to know that God, you got this. It's a good day, beautiful day. We're here to get what God's going to deposit in our life. Amen? Amen. Open up our hearts, be ready to do that. Hey, uh, today we're, we're talking about something that uh, hopefully you're not so super familiar with. Uh, you ever had a, you don't have to, please don't raise your hand, don't acknowledge it, just say, yeah, I know somebody. But you, you took a test and you got the dreaded big F on the top of it, the, the fail. With the, and they, I don't know why, you know, and we have some great teachers, and I'm not going to say anything about that, teachers like that, but the, I don't know, they, it just, they could write it small, but if you have one of those Fs on a paper, it just seems massive. It just seems like it just encompasses the whole page. It could only be in a half an inch, you know, but it seems like it's the whole eight and a half by 11 paper, the gigantic F with a big circle around it, just to let you know that, hey, you failed, Okay. You know, in life, sometimes we go through those things, and we, you know, we may not be walking around with a big F on our head that we, we failed and, you know, and what the problem is, but there are failures in life. There's things that we deal with. You know, I know we, when we moved here, um, I was in the fifth grade, and uh, my, my father was pastoring a church in South Carolina for many years. We moved to western Pennsylvania for a couple years, and then they moved here, and he began pastoring here, uh, here in New Jersey. And so, uh, anyways... And I, I remember coming in, it was the latter part of the, the last semester, it was actually April, April, the end of the school year, which you only have like two and a half, two and a half months of school. It's, it's a very awkward time, if you've ever moved in the middle of a school season, it's hard because you don't know anybody, you don't have any friends, all the friends are kind of picked, so you're kind of the odd person out, nobody knows you, no, you don't, they don't even, it's like they maybe don't even want to know who you are kind of scenario, not, not they, it's just kind of how it is, you know. I had this weird accent, I had a southern accent with a little bit of a western Pennsylvania twist on it, and, you know, they're like, say this, say this, how do you say this? Like, I was speaking a different language, I'm like, this is English, I'm speaking English, you know, you know, they would always ask me to say this or say that, and it was just so frustrating, and, and so I remember um, one of the first days we, out, you know, and uh, so, you know, we're going out to the playground in between, uh, you know, lunchtime or whatever, and, and uh, so they always played kickball, and it was actually the elementary school right down the street from here. And uh, that's the one I attended. And so I remember it was just like, so I hear them out there, and I had never, they wanted to play kickball. I had never played kickball in my life. They, I don't know why. They never, they didn't have it when I was in South Carolina. They didn't have it in Pennsylvania. And so here I go out there and go you know, play kickball. And I'm kind of watching, and, and I guess they kind of were having a little compassion on me because I was the new kid. They, they picked me right away on the team, and, and I get in there, and I'm thinking, boy, you don't know what you just did. So, but because I haven't have a clue to play this game, and, I'll be, and there's not much to it. You just kick the ball, you know, but still, the pressure is on. Nobody knows you. You don't want to be scarred for life after this, you know, because <laughs> they're always going to remember this. And so, and I didn't know how many bases they were. I just, I mean, literally, I had just walked up. They were, you know, picked it, this play. I didn't know there were three bases to it. I mean, it would make sense that it would have three bases, but I didn't know. And I, I kind of watched, and I was kind of one of the, the first, you know, like the second and third person up. And I go up there, and I, man, I kicked the ball. Man, I did great. The ball went way out. And, and they're like, run, I run, I run to first. And then they're like, run, I run to third. And... <laughs> And I run home, I'm thinking, man, I, I got this, I did this, this is amazing. You know, I'm new here, this is really good. And they're like, go back, go back, go. And I'm like, go back where? No one told me that I had to come home and go back somewhere. And everybody's screaming at me, you missed second base. Oh, it was a nightmare. Of course, our team lost, thanks to me. And I guarantee, I, I, I didn't get picked anymore first. I was always the, the last person holding up the wall from then on for the rest of the school year, for the next two and a half months. That failure of, of that moment, it just, it haunted me that year. And it, it just like, oh, I hated it, you know, because it was like the new kid and all the things there. And it totally just made a fool out of myself. And, you know, lo- the team, lo- all this kind of stuff. And. Listen, I practiced kickball a little bit after that you had to make sure I could kick the ball and remember that there's three bases that plus home. Okay, so you have four, you know. But obviously life has other things that are a little bit more, you know, challenging in our life, failures that we deal with, things that we deal with in our life and struggles that we go through and that we fumble of the ball, we drop the ball, we ruin it, mess up something and kind of move forward. And, you know, it's one of those things that really we have to come back and ask sometimes is what failures are we still recovering from? We talked the last couple of weeks and, 
on the aspect of putting our past in the trash. Remember, we had the trash can up here. If you weren't here, you can go back and check it out. But, and it was the point we were making is that we put the past in the trash. It's understanding that Paul said, I, you know, that, I, that the one thing I do is I forget those things on which behind. You know, you, you forget about the trash. I don't, I don't chase the trash, you know, the, the sanitation truck down the street to make sure the trash is okay. I put it in the trash. I don't care what they do with the trash. I care. I, I, I care where it goes. I'm getting in trouble, okay, here. It's like, you know, yes, I want them to ecologically take care of everything the right way. So, but I'm not thinking about it. I'm not praying for the trash. I'm not hoping the trash has a good farewell. You know, it, that whatever I've thrown in there, it's in the trash. They take it, and they put it in a truck, and it's gone. It's, I, I'm, not, I'm not attached to it because once it's in the trash can, I'm not going to dig it out. Listen, if there's a, a piece of pizza that left over from like two days ago on the bottom of the trash, if I'm hungry, I'm not going, I'll go get another slice somewhere else, okay? I'm not going to dig in the trash can in the bottom and pull it out, but we do that with our past. God says, give it to him. We put it in the trash. We, we, we give it to him. We throw it away. And then what happens? We go back a week later, a month later, a year later, digging through that trash and pulling out the stuff that God's already forgiven you from, already been removed from, and we revisit it again. We consume it into our life again. And, and it's this point that we do it many times in the failures in our life. We take those things that we, we have given to God or we kind of move forward and we're still holding on to them. They're still keeping you from moving forward. It, it's still that remembrance of that broken up relationship or that pain or that, that person that shattered your trust. And we hold on to those things and not realizing that it's toxic. You're holding on to this toxic thing that is destroying your, your relationships, your, your future relationships. It's destroying your heart. It's destroying your emotions. It's destroying your mind. And it's keeping you from being and doing all that God wants to do in and through your life because we hold on to those failures and we embrace those failures because we're still recovering from those failures instead of allowing God to help walk us through those things and begin to take steps to say, I'm separating from that. I'm growing. I'm moving beyond it. And, and so today we're going to give you a few steps on this. We're going to look at the story of Joshua as he's leading the children of Israel into the promised land. They take Jericho and some things that happen there. But in, in, in this idea of looking at the, the aspects of failure within our life, um, still recovering because maybe when we're holding on to things, it, it's going to affect your relationships. Maybe there's a, a substance that, 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 you, you've, that you've been saying that I can manage this, but that substance is, that is managing you now. It's a dangerous place when we allow things to, to, to be a part of that life. Maybe you're at a destination in your life that you know is just really not for you. It's not what you're supposed to be. It's not you, but there you are. What do you do? How do we move around and beyond those things? And, you know, failures in, in life occur most of the time when we lose our focus, when we lose our vision, when we take our, our eye off the, the ball off the focus of what we're looking for. That's one of the key things they tell you in, in the majority of sports, especially a sport that involves a ball. Keep your eye on the ball. I don't care what the sport is. You have to keep your eye on the ball. Where's the ball? Because if you don't keep your eye on the, on the ball, then you're not going to know where the ball is. You're not gonna, you're gonna, it's, it's this aspect of staying focused on that. And, you know, it's like this. If keeping your eye focused... If you want your marriage to be healthy, you've got to keep your eye on the ball. You've got to keep your eye, your focus on your marriage. You come out of focus in that relationship and that marriage, guess what? It begins to suffer. You know, it, it's like any other thing that, you know, you think about this. You, you, for to keep a plant healthy and to keep it green from dying or grass, you've got to water it. You know, you've got to water your relationships. You've got to water your marriage. Well, we watered it about 10 years ago, bless God. We went on a retreat. It was good. I don't remember what we did, but it was good. <laughs> no, it's, listen, it's one of these things that it's, it's an everyday thing. You're investing in it every day. You're investing in your relationships with other people, your, your relationship with God. We just spent the last two months talking about how we're investing into our relationships of knowing God and as knowing him, we talked about practice. We didn't use the, all the terminology, but the aspect of as I'm knowing him, as I'm putting into practice his word, I begin to I not only get to know him, I find hope. I find hope for every situation in my life. And as I know him and as I find that hope, then it enables me to see a difference being made in my life as well as me helping make a difference in other people's lives. 
And so when we talk about these things, about marriage and, and, and keeping your eye on your marriage and your kids, your relationship with God, your core values, as God is your source in every part of your life, it's, you know, taking your eye off the ball requires this. When we think about taking our eye off the ball, use marriage as an instance, keeping an eye, an eye on your marriage. In other words, the needs, the, the concerns, the, the ups, the downs, the ends. And if you're not married, it's the, whatever it is, the relationship. What are the values in your life, the things you have? So you keep an eye on it. But see, we're talking about that many of the failures that we, we deal with is because we took our eye off of that. So here's the focus, and all of a sudden, you know, Satan drops another little focus over here, and you, oh, you look, oh, keep my eye on the ball. Oh, what is that? That's interesting. Oh, look, looking over here. Well, what is this? Oh, this is interesting. Wow, look at that. You know, that, that's a little different from this. Oh, uh huh. So what happens? Now you're neglecting this thing over here. You're becoming out of focus. It's like this. We said this last week. You can't drive a car by looking through the rearview mirror. You've got to choose which direction you're going to look, where you're going how you're building that relationship. And so for, for my life and for our life, taking our eye off the ball requires me to remove it off of one thing and focus on something else. And that comes in talking about shifting your focus from one treasure to another treasure. We touched on this last week also. We said this in Matthew chapter 6, 21. For your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. Your heart will always pursue what you value, what you value. Well, that's what, this is what God value, values. Okay, that's great. God values that, but do you value that? A lot of times we say, well, yeah I, I, yeah, I value that, but our heart's doing something else. Because your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. That's an important thing that we understand. You know, we talk about, oh, yeah, I love Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But then once we get out of that, our heart's going to either confirm or betray that. It's what we're going to pursue. What, where's our values really stand? What are the things that we value? Because what your, your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. And so value, and we said this too, value, and this ties into what we're talking about. Value determines your direction and your destination. Value determines your direction and your destination. It's always going to take you in the direction that you're going. So don't lose sight of your core values. What are your core values? What are the things that you value? What are your core values? Your core values are the, th the guiding principles of your life, the things that dictate your behavior, your choices, the right from wrong. It's the things that you say that this is who I am. This is what makes, this is my character, this is my integrity. These are the values that shape who I am. You need to have those defined because if you don't have them defined, then you're going to be focused all over the place. One of the key things that Leslie and I did that right after we got married and was the fact, or actually, I'm sorry, not after we got married. We defined them before we got married. I remember someone saying to me that, you know, if you want, if you, oh, I got to remember how they said it because I'm going to mess it all up. But because I don't want to mess up this one, it would be pretty bad. But so let's go back to the other thing. We defined our values before we got married. Okay? And so in the midst of defining those values, we said this is what we want to do. This is what, so we, we set basically a mission statement for our, for our marriage. And so what happens, anytime we get out of focus with that, we can always come back to this is what our focus, this is what we've chosen to do for this relationship. How we honor each other, how we value each other. Did we get it right every time? Absolutely not. I'm not going to stand up here and say, yes, we're so spiritual and we got it right every single time. Because we didn't get it right every single time. But when we got off course, we knew exactly what course we need to be back on. And that's the important thing, because we're talking about failure. We all are going to fail at certain things. You're going to set out to do something. I'm going to do this, and bam, right on your face. Trip up, stumble. This is not about not failing. It's what to do after you fail. John Maxwell has a great book called Failing Forward. It's a really good book. I would encourage you to read it. I uh, read it many years ago, and it, it's, a, it's a good book. It talks about that failure, whether it's in business or whether it's in, as, a, as, a, as a Christ follower, is that you, when you fail, it's the fact that failing forward, moving forward, learn from that, grow from that, walk forward in that. The fact is that you're never going to get it right every single time, but it's the decision that we make to say that my values are going to be the things that bring me back on course when I get off course, when I, when I stumble, that God's going to bring me back in because I've set the values in my life. Because in a, in, a life, in, a, in a life failure, the goal is always to get back in focus. Back in focus. So many times what happens is we run from God. You, know, you, know, they, they, you mess, miss the mark, you mess up, and what happens is you turn around and before you know it, boom, running, oh, I don't want to go to church. If I go to church, the ceiling will fall in. 
it's not going to fall in. We just use excuses to try to not deal with the failure. I'm going to tell you, we'll, we'll touch it in a few moments, but God always brings you back to a place where you have to face that failure to move forward. You've got to face it. You can't hide from it. You face it and move forward. And so, so many times we try to run away from God, but God is compassionate and committed to your future. He is passionate about enabling you to run the race that is set before you. I love the, the picture of the story of the prodigal son. Yeah, the sun aspect is great, but you know what I really love the picture? It's the picture that depicts the heart of the father standing there waiting for his son that has squandered his wealth, that has wasted his time, that has done all these things. I'm sure the father said, don't do, stay focused. God's got great things for your life, all these things. And what does he do? He totally ignores everything the father tells him to do and runs hard and fast in the opposite direction. And then all of a sudden wakes up and is like, Hey, the people that work with my dad are eating better than I'm eating here as I'm hanging out with the pigs. Let me see if I can go back home and work for my dad. He comes to his senses and he comes back. The picture I'm talking about is the picture of the father that is waiting for the, for the, for the return of his son. The father that's running to his son. Not the one that's like, told you, I knew you were going to mess up. No. What does he do? He embraces him with a hug. He puts a new robe of, 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 of speaking of acceptance upon his heart, his life, a ring on his finger of, his, of who he is and the family that he belongs to. He brings all these things into place. And it's this picture that God has of how he loves each and every one of us. No matter how much you screw up the situation. I can say that on a Sunday morning, right? Okay, good, thank you. Because it really kind of pictures what I'm trying to say. No matter how much we mess it up, destroy it, obliterate it, God's standing there saying, I'm here waiting for you. When you come back to your senses, when you realize that it's wrong, I'm waiting to hug you. I'm waiting to embrace you. I'm hugging. I'm waiting to put a robe around you, a ring on your finger to accept you back because that is my heart. That is the heart of the Father. Yes, God hates sin, but he loves you more than the sin that we fall in. And he's always welcoming to bring you back into that place. I know as a dad, and I, I've talked about this, there's times that you, if you have kids, you know there's times that you, know, you want to ship them off to grandma's house. There's times that you, you're like, you, you want to go on a long trip somewhere? You know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, but I think you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of things that runs through the thought of a, a mind of a parent, right, that you don't always verbalize. So let me just kind of share it a little bit with everybody. But it's the frustrations and, ah, you know, I told them that. Why didn't they listen to that? I knew better. And they, I told them, ah, I didn't even listen. Just mess it all up. But even though I could be angry and frustrated, it's that love for them that still embraces them, that still is willing to, to deal with that and move on with that. The same way that my parents and your parents did for you and their parents did for them, the heart of the Father is even so much more greater than that. To embrace, embrace. And that's the picture. Getting back in focus. That's why Paul was able to say in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But the reality is in the middle of all that, Paul didn't get it all right every single time. Paul missed the mark on occasions. But in the middle of that, his consistency to stay focused and where he was going, despite the hiccups, despite the th situations in between, is the same thing for us that challenges us. Because really, you know, some, maybe you're at a place where, you know, you started good, but you got out of focus. You know, your focus is awful. Maybe that's where you are right now. You're like, yeah, I love God, but I'm kind of eh, in a gray area right now. I want to tell you, it's not just about how you start, but it's how you finish well. Finish well. God wants to, he's committed to enabling you to finish well, but I've got to be committed to finishing well in my life. Amen? So let's look at our story here. Joshua chapter 6, we, we see Moses has died. Joshua's picking up. He's leading now the children of Israel into the promised land. They're going to take the city of Jericho. The city of Jericho was a huge fortified city. Hadn't been taken before. It was a major thing. I mean, you've got to figure these people have been wandering around in the desert for all these past years. They're, they're really not seasoned warriors as, as maybe others would be. I'm sure they, 
you know, had training, did different things at some point, but, but they're not like these Spartans or something like that out, you know, that, you know, this whole scenario. And so they're coming into this huge city, and God says, you're going to take the city. It's yours. I've given it, I've given the city. In fact, Joshua, you have to think, Joshua is kind of like a little concerned here too, being a, Excuse me, because we find Joshua at that point that he comes around and, you know, God pulls him aside and says, hey, Joshua, I want you to see this. You know, he says, he says, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and courageous. You know, sometimes we need to hear things a couple times, right? Because the first time it doesn't get past the, the, the worry, the concern, and whatever is going on. So God tells him again, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and of good courage. Because you know why? We got this, Joshua. We're going to see this through. I'm with you. You're not by yourself. And so he comes in and encourages them. Now they go forward, and, and we'll just kind of pick the story up real quick. They're about to take the city. There are some specifications that God tells Joshua to tell the people of how to handle. This was, this, this city, Jericho, was, was, was to, a city that was, there was a lot of other cities they were going to take, but this one was to be dedicated to God. All the spoils of it was to go toward the treasury uh, for, for God and what he was doing. And what he was basically, basically saying to them, give me this and I'll give you all the rest of the cities that you're going to take. And so he gives them specific, specifics of what they're supposed to do. So verse 16, he picks it up here. The seventh time, time around, they're all marching around the city at this point. The seventh time around, when the priests shouted the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies that we sent. But keep away from the devoted things. In other words, those things that were consecrated to God, the spoils of the city. So that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver, the gold, the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and all the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Well, this, is, this is the Jericho victory. This is huge for them. They're going in. The walls have come down. It's a, it's a huge place. There's, there's actually, um, you know, the, the ruins of Jericho. You can, go, you can go to Israel and you can see them. The, the walls, it's like they just kind of sunk into the ground, which is what we're saying. It was like they just pushed down, and the people went in and, and, and took the city. It's a victory. But it doesn't quite go exactly as it should. They pick it up, and this becomes the, the failure part of this great victory. Verse, uh, verses 1 through 5 of chapter 7, it says, But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things. So the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town of Ai, east of Bethlehem, near uh, Bethel, uh, near Bev, Beth Avon. When they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for us to go up, up there. He says, it won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai. There, uh, since there are so few of them, don't make all our people struggle to go up there. Now, just let's look for a second. They just won this big victory. No one knows about the fact that Achan has stolen these things, which now is going to bring a big ripple effect upon the next battles that they have. But do you notice a little bit of a pride taking place here? Not a little bit. It's a lot of pride. Hey, we took Jericho. Nobody could take Jericho. We took, we took Jericho. Right? Remember last week we talked about the fact about that God makes up the difference for our inadequacies. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's a lot of pride taking place. We, we got this. Just send us a, you know, just 3,000 men. We got this. We get, this is nothing. This is such a small place. Jericho is huge. We're good with this. We got this. Don't worry about this. It's going to be okay. And so they go through this whole thing. The pride is swelling. Man, we're like, they're probably beating their chest. <laughs> we got this, you know, all kind of things going on. They're, you know, they're feeling like, yeah, we are, we are warriors, you know. We are Sparta. No, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a different movie. So, okay. Um, it's no need. <laughs> it says, since there are so few of them, don't make all our people struggle to go up there. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites, chased them from the 
town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear as this turn of events and their courage melted away. They whooped their rear ends, as you'd say down south. Okay, some would say other words, but we'll put it as that. See, they went in there with this arrogance, this pride. We got this. We can do this. Not knowing that they were totally doing it on their own. Not just because of their pride, but because of the fact that they totally missed what God had told them to do back there at the last victory. In the middle of this great victory, Achan was focused on, uh, on the stuff. Remember we talked about you got to keep your focus in the right place, the values. And how that... You know, it also shows that the picture that, you know what, we, we sit there and say, well, what, how am I going to affect anybody? This is just me. This is, this is my decision. This is my choice. But what we don't realize, especially in families and, and in relationships, one person's decision not only affects them, but affects everybody that's around them. And so valuing those things and understanding. So this guy gets this focus. He, he puts focus on something else. And, and as a result of that, they had this huge defeat. And so it's from this story that we see how they recovered from this failure. So I want to give you, there's six things. Don't panic. We will be out of here in time for you to eat lunch. Amen. They're quick, six quick things. All right. But the first thing is this. How do we recover from a failure? Looking at this story, looking at what they did, how can we apply that to our life? The first thing is, number one, because they're despondent, because they're despair, because they're, it says that their hearts melted like water. They were weakened and paralyzed as a result. They were shocked. That they, how, do we, how can we lose this battle? The first thing i got to do is come back to that place and trust God again. When your faith has been shaken, even if it you know, what I always find too, a lot of times what happens is we, we make a bad decision and we blame God for it. God, why did you let that happen? He's like, I had nothing to do with it. It was all your decision. Maybe he says it a little different than I'm saying, but that's basically, I've, that's my interpret. that's the Fred McCarthy interpretation, okay. Because it's like this, he gives us a free choice, he gives us free will. We can choose to follow it his way, follow his word, or we can choose to do it our own. I love the fact that even when we mess it up, that the heart of the Father is still there to pick it back up. Work us through the ripple effect that that sin can have in our life. And be with us through the whole end and bring restoration in our life. Amen. He's a faithful father. And so it's coming back and trusting him again. Joshua was leading this group of people that had disobeyed God. They'd slipped from their walk, and they'd gotten off track from him. And now Joshua's depressed. He's upset. In fact, Joshua does it this way in, in chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. He says, then Joshua tore his clothes, fell, down to the uh, fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. And Joshua said, alas, sovereign Lord, why? <laughs> you ever said why? Why me? Why is this happening to me? And sometimes it's not because you did anything, but sometimes it is because we made some stupid decisions. I've been there. But God says, verse, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Now, he's t why is he telling him not to be afraid? Because he was afraid. I'm leading all these people. The second battle we stepped in, we just got defeated by a small group of, pe a group of people. As a leader, I'm sure he's afraid. They don't want them coming after me. I'm a failure. He's thinking all these things. I'm sure he probably feels like a failure as a result of all that. But God comes back and says, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. See, when you, when you sin and you, you get off track, when you get out of focus, Satan immediately comes back to try to convince you that God is so disappointed in you that he doesn't want you back. And that's wrong. And that's where we got to come back to that place and, and remember the picture of the, pro, the, the father in the story of the prodigal son, of the love that God has for us. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, it says this, I will demonstrate my mercy to them and will forgive their evil deeds and never remember again their sins. I love that. God says, but I will extend, I will demonstrate my mercy to them. Demonstrate my mercy. That embrace, that that picking up and, and leading you through, walking you through all of that, God's promise to complete the work that he started in your life. The second thing is this, I've got to begin following God again. I've got to begin following him again. 
In order for Joshua to get back on track with God, he had to begin following God again. In fact, in in the latter part of verse 1, what we just read, it says, Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai, for I have delivered into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. What is God telling him? He says, Joshua, I want you to go back and face your failure. That had to be a difficult point. He says, take everybody and go back to the same place that chased you guys all the way. In fact, you went running and screaming down a hill away from these people. And I want you to get back up, trust me, and let's go do it again. you got to face your failure. And that's that challenge point that we deal with in so many times is that when we failed in an area of really trusting that, God, you can see me through this, that you can walk me through this, and that I can face it, and I can move beyond it and see God's victory in the midst of the situation, despite the failure. It, but it really comes back to the point, me going in it with me, I can fail. But me going in it with God, I'm going to move forward in him. He has the word and the final say of what takes place. It was trusting him again and coming back to that place of trusting him again. And so God is telling him, get focused. Follow me again. And the third thing we see is that happens is remembering. He, re- he brings him back to, to a place to remember the victories of yesterday. Now, we spent two weeks talking last week in, in, in and out of what we were talking about, about, the, about today, what matters most is, you know, today. And, but in the part of forgetting those things which are behind, forgetting the past, leaving those past behind, moving beyond those things. It, and moving in those things, allowing that to be the part that challenges and, and, and focuses our life. But, and so that we were talking about the things that seize our life, that pris- imprison our life, that paralyze our life. But there are things that we do go back and look at. There's things that, I, I don't know about you, but I've learned from the mistakes in my past. I won't allow those mistakes to anchor me. I won't become a servant or a slave to those failures but I want to learn from those failures. I want to learn from the past things in my life. I mean, I think only a fool will never learn from the past things in their life. You know, they say, well, I did it then. I know it, I'm just going to do it again. <laughs> no, that's not, not the smartest thing to do, you know. Do it differently. Okay, if it didn't work before, it's probably not going to work this way unless God says, I got you, we're going to, like in this situation. I want to learn from my mistakes. But I also have to go back and visit the victories that God has, has brought in my life. Some of, the, some of the biggest challenges that I've had to go through, that had the faith to be able to move forward in those things, was me going back and remembering how that God has provided in past things. How that he's met me, he's, he's, he's saved me, he's, he's opened up doors of opportunity, that he's done things that seemed impossible. When I go back and visit those things and look at those things, it enables me to be fueled for what's ahead. And this is exactly what happens. Joshua 8, 2, it says, You shall do to Ai and his king as you did to Jericho and its king. So what does he do? He's bringing him back to the same point. And he says, I'm reminding you of what you did at Jericho. But what happened at Jericho? They they defeated them. God was with them, despite the whole Achan issue. And what he did, that guy did. Like David standing before Goliath. You hear me say this a lot because this has been a principle of my life. As David is standing before Goliath, it's a new, it's a new conquest. It's a new territory. He would never fought, you know, a guy that was so a seasoned warrior like Goliath. And what does he do? He comes back. He says, Father, I thank you that you delivered me for the, for the lion, the bear. You got this. You're going to see me through this. And to come back to those places. And so for us, it's coming back. For Joshua, he had to come back and look at and examine the fact that, God, you delivered me there in Jericho. You met me there in Jericho. And you know what? And yes, you can do this. You can take care of this situation. Joshua was reminded of what God had done for him in his past and to move forward because in the midst of that, God, you're going to see me through. That he's still the same God that brought the victory. He's still able to meet him in the middle of the situation. And he's going to walk him in and through those things. See, remembering the past victories and God's faithfulness fuels the courage for tomorrow's victories. When I go back and I look at and remember what God did in my past and how that God provided, that it fuels, it gives me the ability. Remembering those past victories and God's faithfulness fuels the courage of tomorrow's victories. It enables me to take the step to move forward. It enables me to take the step to trust him and know that, God, you got this. You're going to see me through in this. That you're faithful enough to see me, to to enable me. And when I see what God and God's faithfulness, when I remember his faithfulness, it gives me 
that strength, the faith to rise up and say, God, I'm going to trust you in this. You're going to see me through. Amen? I know we have a slide on that. If you guys could put that up because I think that's important that we have that today. That you need to have that picture to know that God fuels us and enables us with the things that he remembers in our past. Amen? You with me? Okay. Psalms 103 verse 2 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Reminding ourselves of what God has done. Reminding ourselves of his victories. When failure beats you up, I need to remember the past victories and God's faithfulness because it's going to encourage my life. Amen? The fourth thing is this, don't make the same mistake again. Don't make the same mistake again. Like I said, learn from your mistakes. Joshua 8, verse 2, it says, You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. This was the same battle, different. And God's saying, listen, we're not going to make the same mistake. This time, yeah. And I, I love the picture, too, of God's forgiveness. He, bring, he restores them back. He says, you know what? I mean, he could have been like, you know what? You messed up the last one, so I'm going to keep this one too. <laughs> but he doesn't. Showing his mercy and his faithfulness. The problem was that, you know, Israel had only partially listened to what God said at Jericho. See, read, the, you know, look at, listen to, look at John chapter 15, verse 9. It says this. John 15, verse 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands and you remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, remain in his love, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. See, it's getting in God's word, keeping God's word. What does it do? As I, you know, it's like this. As I read God's word, it gets inside. It's like a, it's like a reservoir that builds up in my life, that his word is, is pouring into my heart, my life. And you know, the, the reality is that what, what I find in my life is that as I get God's word in, I may, it may not even be something that I'm using right now, but you know what? When I least expect it, something comes up from the inside of me that reminds me, hey, you remember that we read that last week? Or you don't even know when you read it. All of a sudden, it just rises to the top exactly when you need it, giving you the strength, the wisdom. It's that word from God that he's put inside of you that comes alive inside of you. So as I read his word, his word begins, and then I begin to be renewed by his word. My life is renewed by the word of God. It, gives, it breathes life and, and hope and faith and purpose within my life. But it starts with me getting God's word inside of me. Because I can't be renewed by his word if I haven't put God's word inside of me. Amen? There's no pill that you can just take. You can't just open up the Bible app and plug it in somewhere and download it inside of you. I got to hear it. I got to get it in my heart. I got to read it, get it inside of me. And then as God's word begins to renew me, it reworks my life. It begins to reshape my life. It begins to transform my life, my hopes, my dreams, my passions, my values. It begins to refocus those things, but it all comes back. I get his word inside of me. And that's why Jesus is saying, you want joy? Get into God's word. Keep his commands and look at the love, the joy that comes alive inside of you as you read his word. As, you were, as his word begins to be renewed in your life, it begins to shape you, and then it begins to rework your life by molding and shaping your life at the, after the heart of the Father. If the Bible talks about the fact that, that we had the mind of Christ, how do you get the mind of Christ? you got to get God's word inside of you, and it shapes you so that your mind begins, you begin to think like Jesus. In other words, you begin to allow his word, you begin to see God's power and presence and wisdom and direction within your life instead of the big old F on, on, your, on your head or your life. You're saying, failure. You're only a failure. You're not only a failure. You're not a failure. You're blood bought, blood bought, blood washed child of God. Amen. He calls you his son and daughter. As a result of that, you're not a failure. You are his, his child. And we move forward with that. Amen. Okay. The fifth thing is this, is let God lead again. Psalms 37, verse 23 through 24 says it this way. It says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life. God delights in the details of your life. You know, there's a lot of people, you ever talk to someone and you're telling them about something, they're like, oh, they got that like blank look on their face. Oh, yeah, oh, that's cool, good, oh. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh. If you quizzed them, they would have no idea what you just said. Totally uninterested. You know, I, I, I love history. And 
you know, um, when, I was, when I was young, uh, I, had a, I think I told this one time, I had a missionary that gave me her stamp collecting book. And I know it seems like a boring subject maybe for you, you know, like that, but I started doing it. I was, I was in fifth grade. That was around the same time when, that I was traumatized by kickball, you know. <laughs> and, um, but she gave me this, and she had a collection that she had been doing since she was a teenager, and she was in her 80s at this point. So I valued this. this was, it, was, it was a huge collection that she had her whole life in this over the years and her travels as a missionary. And I, I learned, I'd go through and I'd discover so many different countries, and I would learn about them. And it just it sparked an interest in the world. And you know, I always tell people, if I, if I wasn't doing this job, I would make a really good travel agent because I really, I know about places. I read about different cultures, cult, cultures and countries and all these things. And I learned a lot of it from just collecting stamps and how it triggered in that. And, um, you know, so I, I'll get into conversations. Someone will ask me about something. I'll start talking. Blah, 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 you know, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm excited about it. It's a topic that, whether history or, or culture or, or countries and different things like that, that's something I've read or, or experienced. And, and you can just see them glazed over, just eh, glazed, have no idea, just, just like lost you at the first sentence, okay? And, you know, because some people just aren't interested. And that, I don't mean it mean, it's just they, they can't connect or whatever. And so, but I love the fact that you may feel like nobody connects with you, but God's promise is this. It says that he directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Even the things that you're boring all your family and friends with, God says he is interested in those details, right? This is the next part. I love this last part. Though they, what does it say? Stumble. Guys, put that, put that, please put that back on the screen, that verse, please. Though they stumble, they will never fall. Though they stumble, they will never fall. We've got to get that ahead. Though they stumble, they will never fall. Doesn't that sound a little contradictory? How can you stumble and not fall? It's because he tells you why. They will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Now, let me give you the imagery of this. My son and daughter, of course, they're five years apart, but each of them, when they were just learning to walk, I would take them by the hand, Leslie too. Sometimes it was, you know, when they're just starting, you, those of you who have kids, you know what I'm talking about, you get the both hands and you're kind of doing this kind of walk, you know, with them. And all of a sudden, you graduate to the, the one-handed hold. And they're kind of walking, they're kind of, we call them toddlers because that's all they do. They're toddling back and forth. It's like weevils that wobble, but they do fall down. <laughs> you know, some of you don't know what weevils are, but some of you do. Okay. I'm showing my age on that toy, that's for sure. Anyways, okay. So I'm hold, holding under their hand. And I've got a hold of their hand strong because I know they're just learning to walk. And they go, and all of a sudden they stumble, and it's like... Phew, I've kind of dislocated their arm probably, their joint, but <laughs> the fact is I still got them. They may have stumbled... But I didn't let them fall because I was holding onto their hand. So you may stumble, but as a, as a parent is holding on, or, or some, a caregiver is holding on to that child that's just learning to walk, they may stumble, they may fall, they may even skin the knee or something, but, but they're not in peril because they've got a hold of them. They're holding onto them. You, you may stumble, but you'll never fall because God's holding you by the hand. There's times that you feel like, like you just obliterated, but God's like, no, you're not, because I've got you by the hand. See, you, you got to put it in your head, because there's times that you feel like you totally missed it, like you totally failed, and there's no way out of this, but God's telling you that it may seem like it, but his promise is that it's just a stumble. He's got you by the hand. All you need to do is allow him to pick you up, get you back on your feet like a parent would do, and let's just go walk again. And I did that hundreds of times with my kids as they were learning to walk. And eventually, you know what? They're like, I got this. No, Daddy. No, uh, me. I got it. No. <laughs> now that little independent thing comes out on them. And they're wobbling along. But they, I got this. This is me. I, no, no. No hold hand. No. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. See, he's with us. And he's going to see us through. He's leading you, even when you don't even realize he's leading you. And the last thing is this. This is, this is important. I know it went way past what I normally was going to do, but that's not the last few weeks. That's been kind of normal. <laughs> so <laughs> oof. the sixth thing is this, worship again. you got to worship again. 
That's exactly what happens in Joshua. He comes back through all the, the, the full circle of following God, the failure, God bringing him back into trust. He comes back around in Joshua 8.30. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. He builds an altar to worship God at that place. Joshua had to celebrate the victory. See, he had to come back to the place, the full circle of keeping his focus, re, reigniting his focus on, on his heavenly Father. You see, Psalms 22.3 says, You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. See, God is enthroned on the praises of his children, on the praises of his people. When we worship, it's more than just singing a song. It's more than just saying nice things and saying who God is and these things like that. It literally, worship restores the connections of our heart. It brings things back in focus. It puts God back on the throne of our life situation and puts us back into focus on the things that are important within our life. It's this understanding that, God, that you are in control here. That, you see, see, worship, it, it, it brings us. Why don't we do the worship aspect in the beginning of the service? Because you know why? Some of you have had a little discussion, also known as an argument, on the way here this morning. None of you, the other people, first third service, third service, you guys I know don't, but so we'll talk about them. Um, you've had some things that, that have that escalated on the way to church, and you pull in the driveway, and you're smiling at the, the people that are serving in Hallelujah. Bless. Thank you, Jesus. We're at church. Thank you. Jesus. Woo, woo. Jesus. Kids, smile right now before I kick you under the seat. Right now. Just smile. Okay. All right. I know none of you have ever experienced anything like that in your life, but anyway. And you come in, and man, you're still, your brain is still like, ah. But if you'll just put that aside and begin to worship, God does a miraculous thing. It begins to melt that away. Because worship refocuses the heart connections. It puts God back on the throne. And it puts us back in focus on what really matters. Never, never neglect the worship aspect of our life. Whether it's in a service like this. Well, it's not my favorite song. It's not about you. We're not singing it to you. <laughs> it's not your song. Amen. I don't know why we think, well, I don't, it's not for you. It's not for me. I may not be your style. And there's times I'm singing, I'm like, I don't like this song. But it's not about me. Because you know it, but it's, it's, getting the, cause it's getting the focus right, right? God, I'm here to worship you. I'm here to honor you and thank you. Throughout your week, man, you need to be doing that. There needs to be times throughout the day Throughout the whole week, I mean, there's times that my, my, I get so stressed and so many things going on, and I'll, I'll get in my car and I'm driving somewhere, I'll put on worship music, and I'll just take that moment and just hear it and listen to it and listen to it and listen to it and let it saturate my heart and saturate my mind. To re Why? Because it's reconnecting the heart connection, the focus of what really matters. It's reviving, it's strengthening, it's bringing new life. And it's not even about whether I like this song or not. It's, God, it's about you. I'm thanking you. I'm worshiping you. I'm not asking you to pay the visa bill this year. I'm not asking you to get me out of this jam, that mess. God, this is about you, who you are, your greatness, your faithfulness, and the worthy to receive my honor and my praise unto you, Father. I thank you, bringing it back into focus. See, when I've gone through a failure, see, it comes to this point. I've got to come back to that place. The restoration of my heart is vital to God. And as I refocus my heart, that, that failure, it has no place. It can't hold my life as I'm focused on him and putting him back on the throne of my life and my heart. Would you stand with me? Father, I thank you today that the Holy Spirit continue to move in our life and challenge us to move forward in you in a greater way. Lord, I just thank you, Father, let the Holy Spirit continue this message into every life. You know, that every, you know every need, every detail of where we are. And I thank you that you so masterfully speak into each individual exactly where they are that enables us to take this and apply it to our life and move from this place and see your purpose and your plan just executed in everything that we do. May we know your heart and we know we know your love and walk in that mercy and grace that you extend to us every day, even in the middle of the places that we miss it and we fail. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>